shoe. And I like Hannah, Dave, uh, Merry Christmas. Timothy Dudley Smith begins his 1987 Christmas hymn with a question. Where do Christmas songs begin? Where indeed? Where do Christmas songs begin? By the stable of an inn? Or where the songs of hosts on high mingled with a baby's cry? There for joy and wonder smiled man and maid and holy child. Christmas songs begin with them. Sing the songs of Bethlehem. He goes on to ponder who it was that was born in Bethlehem. He it is who formed the skies. And he explains that only love can answer why he should come to grieve and die. And finally he ends where the angels sang at nativity, exhorting us to join them. Join we now as one with them, sing the songs of Bethlehem. So, on this nativity morning, let's think again of the one it is that we have come to celebrate and what he came to do. The events of that day just over 2,000 years ago started something that continues right to this very day, doesn't it? And beyond to the day when the baby who was born in Bethlehem will come again as the judge of angels and of men. So before we hear the greatest sermon ever sung, and I'm not going to sing it, let's join, I think, and sing a hymn from the Apsley Hymnal. It's towards the back, number 605. It's one of those sort of Christmas carols. Um, I don't think I've heard it sung actually for quite a wee while, um, but it takes us uh, again before the Lord and reminds us that he is the king of glory and what he has done as Emmanuel. I thought maybe, I wasn't sure how many folks were here and I'm not sure sometimes how many folks know these hymns, so I'm going to slip over to the piano and uh, we'll maybe give it as uh, I was asked once to play at a funeral and uh, the grieving husband told me at his wife's funeral that I had to play the piano and I had to give it some welly. Well, I'm not maybe quite give it too much welly this morning, but perhaps it would help us just as we, we praise the Lord. 605 uh, is the number. Who is he in yonder stall? At whose feet the shepherds fall. Tis the Lord. A wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. I think we're probably going to stand and sing this.
Well, do you know the greatest sermon ever sung? Do you know what it is? Well, that's what Tony uh, Prittiger, who was a like American Lutheran pastor, called Handel's Messiah. And in fact, it's the title of a little book that he wrote that contains the whole of the text and a running commentary on it and some stunning illustrations from one of his friends. And I suppose the Messiah has long been associated with Christmas. In fact, uh, my dad took my mum out for their first big night out to the Messiah in the Ulster Hall. Uh, that was a bit before I was born. Uh, but uh, it's always been a bit of a feature in our house. We've been there uh, to hear it many times, and uh, we've heard, well, one and a half times they only sang part of it, at one of the things that we were uh, engaged in uh, online to this uh, Christmas. But it actually, it was first performed in Dublin. I don't know if you realize that. It was first performed in Dublin uh, about a fortnight after Easter in 1742. And uh, in fact, it raised 400 pounds for charity. That's a, the equivalent today of about a million pounds. That's some going, isn't it? And this little music hall, it's not there anymore. Um, funny enough, you can actually see where it is. There's a, um, there's a gateway and the top half of the uh, entrance to the, or the building that what was the music hall is still there. And the firm of solicitors is exactly the same firm of solicitors uh, just next door to it. But they had to squeeze in 700 people who wanted to attend it. So the men were asked to leave their swords at home. And the women were told not to wear hoops under their dresses. Those were different times. Well, I'm not going to sing it to you this morning. And we're not going to listen to it either because you might not just have a couple of hours to spare. There might be some turkeys that uh, wouldn't appreciate that. But... What I do want to do is I want to read the entire text of it. Now, don't worry, it, it takes two hours to sing it, but they do a lot of repeats if you haven't heard it. Uh, and this is going to be shorter. We're just going to read all of the text, the libretto. Um, Charles Jennings, who was the man who selected the text for uh, Handel, and Handel wrote the music in just 24 days, but Jennings, a year afterwards, Jennings put together a little book, a little word book, in which all of the text of Scripture was included. But he put some headings in across, and it's done like an opera uh, would have been done there with three acts, three parts, and I think there are 16 different scenes. So what I'm going to do is intersperse the headings that he put in his little book, uh, and it's entirely Scripture. It's King James, by the way. I'm not going to change it. I was brought up like that. I'm sorry if uh, well, hopefully you'll understand it. It's the traditional words, uh, although actually the versions from the Psalms don't come from the King James. They come from the prayer book, uh, but it just doesn't sound the same, you know, and those of us who know the music, you hear it in your head. So I hope I don't break into song at a few points there. Are just, and you can stand when the Hallelujah Chorus comes as well, if you want, um, on that. But it, it's an interesting thing because it takes us through some of the prophecies of the Messiah, right through to the birth of Emmanuel. And then it takes us briefly through the life of Christ, but it concentrates on his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and culminates at the end of the second part not the third part, not the very end. Everybody assumes the climax is the Hallelujah Chorus at the end. No, it's not. It's at the very second part it comes, the Hallelujah Chorus. I think that's the right place for it. And then there is a third part, because that isn't the end of it. And that part reminds us of the demise of death and our own bodily resurrection. Those of us who have come around this table this morning to remember the Lord Jesus and know the pardon and the redemption and the adoption that Calvary has provided. And it ends with a hymn of praise, worthy is the Lamb. Well, actually, there's another one that's called Amen, and it goes on, Amen, 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 Amen. But, but what else can you say when you've just sung, worthy is the Lamb? And the hymn we just sang there, and I chose that specifically because it's like, a bit like a mini Messiah. So you get to sing a little bit of the, the sort of extent of the story. 
So let's hear the word of God, and we're going to begin in the gospel of Isaiah. Yes, the gospel of Isaiah. That's a good place to start, isn't it? It's where the, it's actually where Mark begins uh, his gospel, even though he doesn't tell us about the nativity. And in fact, if you think about it, every gospel of the four gospels begins before the birth of the Savior, doesn't it? They all begin in different places, but Christmas songs might begin at Bethlehem. We put that in a card we sent to a friend. She said she didn't agree with it. Uh, Well, yeah, Christmas songs might begin at Bethlehem, but the story begins much, much earlier. And it stretches all the way into eternity. You may not be able to follow along because I'm not going to announce where I'm reading from, so you'll have to guess if you don't know. Uh, There's just too many verses. And we might be here for the two hours if I start waiting for you to find it, so I hope that's all right with you. But the first part is entitled, The Prophecy and Realization of God's Plan to Redeem Mankind by the Coming of the Messiah. It starts before Bethlehem with the prophecy of salvation. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. I didn't know we were going to sing that hymn. Isn't that amazing? The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill made low. The crooked straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And then there's the prophecy of the coming of Messiah. And the question that despite this prophecy that we've read, of what this may indeed portend for the world. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, yet once a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts." But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then there's the prophecy of the virgin birth, or I suppose really we really should say the virginal conception, but the the term has stuck, so we're stuck with it. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up into the high mountain. O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Arise, shine, for your light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. And gross darkness the people. 
but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then there is the appearance of the angels to the shepherds. There were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, have you ever noticed any time you read about angels, this is exactly their opening words, isn't it? Fear not. And the angel said unto them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward Man. There are, of course, many miracles that the Lord performed on earth. And we're reminded of those. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is the righteous Savior, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. I think maybe I'm looking at a bunch of heathen. I'm sort of half heathen, half Jew, so maybe I could say that, can I? Are you a bunch of heathen? Well, you need to be heathen if you want to hear the peace that the Lord speaks. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Isn't it interesting? There's one more reading in this section, but uh, isn't it interesting where Charles Jenner chose those passages from to talk about Christ's redemptive miracles on earth. They're not from the New Testament. They're from the Old Testament. I better not spoil this in case you're trying to figure out where they all came from. But then he continues with some very well-known uh, sentences from the New Testament. Come unto him. Come unto him, all ye that labor, Come unto him that are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you and learn of him, for he is meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. His yoke is easy, and his burthen is light. That's the end of the first part. Now we come to the second part, and Jenner uh, entitled this, The Accomplishment of Redemption by the Sacrifice of Jesus, Mankind's Rejection of God's Offer, and Mankind's Utter Defeat When Trying to Oppose the Power of the Almighty. 
You can see he wouldn't have sold too many books if he'd put a title like that on it. But isn't that wonderful? The redemption, redemption grind we sang earlier, didn't we? Redemption by the sacrifice of Jesus. I mean, even on Christmas morning, you can't get away from it, can you? That he came to die, to give himself as a sacrifice. And the sadness to think too of mankind's rejection of God's offer. As we saw a number of folks on their way to church services, the one across the road from us and one as we passed down the road, but that was a bit unusual. Most of the times when we come down the road, they're not heading towards church on a Sunday morning. They're heading towards the brasserie for their breakfast or whatever. And it just typifies in a way, doesn't it, mankind's rejection of God's offer. Listening to the odd clip on the television or whatever in the radio. Somebody this morning had a request in Classic FM. What was it? I believe in Father Christmas, their favorite Christmas song. Well, it was okay. Uh, sounded nice enough, but if that's your faith, it ain't going to save you. It ain't going to give you redemption. And it just, in a sense, don't want to be a Grinch or whatever, but, you know, Christmas is not about the family. Christmas is not about the presents. Christmas is not about the songs. Christmas is about the Savior and God's offer as to why he sent his son. Well, let's get on and read the passages before I preach and the turkey gets burnt. First of all, he says there's the redemptive sacrifice, the scourging and the agony on the cross. Those well-known verses I remember, having to sing these in Latin for Bach's B minor mass. When I was at school, everybody had to sing that. You weren't just in the choir. I think the whole school was the choir. Uh, but there we are. Behold the Lamb of God. Ecce. Agnus Dei. Qui tollis peccatum. Anyway, that taketh away the sin of the world. I better not speak in tongues. He was despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that plucked off his hair. He hid not his face from shame and spitting. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I can't help think of those verses, but to see a blackboard standing here, you know what a blackboard is. It's a whiteboard, only black, and you use chalk. Whenever I was at school, that's what, that's what you did. And this hall would have been filled with maybe two to 300 young people from around the area. There were many more houses here. And on that blackboard was written these words from Isaiah 53. And every single child in that room, myself included, my dad took one of the verses, Reggie Dornan, the late Reggie Dornan, took another and some of the other men, you wouldn't know them. And they all took their turn at it to teach us those verses. Christmas memories. Maybe you have other Christmas memories, but as I'm reading them, I just can't help but think of that blackboard and the men who've gone before in this place. And perhaps you have other memories of men and women that you have in mind who are not with us, but yet their legacy lives on, doesn't it? In the scriptures they taught us 
and the life they lived and the saviour they loved and adored. Back to Calvary. All they that see him laugh him to scorn. They shoot out their lips and shake their heads saying, he, he trusted in God that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delight in him. Thy rebuke hath broken his heart. He is full of heaviness. He looked for some to have pity on him, but there was no man. Neither find he any to comfort him. Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow. As we think of his sacrificial death, we think too of his passage through hell and resurrection. He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of thy people was he stricken. But thou didst not leave his soul in hell, nor didst thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And after the resurrection, the ascension. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And then God discloses Christ's identity in heaven. Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Let all the angels of God worship him. And after that, there's Whitson or Pentecost as we call it today. The gift of tongues, the beginning of evangelism. Thou art gone up on high, thou hast led captivity captive and received gifts for men, yea, even from thine enemies, that the Lord God might dwell among them. The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of the preachers. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Their sound is gone out into all the lands and their words unto the ends of the world. But the world and its rulers reject the gospel. Why do the nations so furiously rage together? And why do they, the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their yokes from us. But he that dwelleth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. We're reminded of God's triumph. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, omnipotent, reigneth. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Obviously not Pentecostal, you would have joined me with that. Do you want to? One, two, three. Hallelujah. Still not Pentecostal. Can we try it again? One, two, three. Hallelujah. And then there's a third part. It's very short. It's a hymn of thanksgiving for the final overthrow of death. There's the promise of bodily resurrection and redemption from Adam's fall. So I keep wanting to try and burst into song, but you won't want to hear me. But I know that my Redeemer liveth, 
and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And the worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. For now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep, since by man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But there is, of course, the day of judgment and that general resurrection. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then there's the victory over death and sin. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of sin is, the death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall lay, sorry, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, rather, yea, that is risen again. Who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. And then the final double chorus headed the glorification of the messianic victim. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God by his blood to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. That's where it ends around the throne, singing worthy is the Lamb. If the mince pies will keep for a minute, maybe we should sing a little hymn to finish. And we'll sing one that echoes that, I think. To join the angels in singing the praises of the one whose birth we come to remember. And fittingly, the tune that we're going to sing is called Nativity. I hope you know it, but I'll give it a blast anyway. And I'm sure there's enough of us who know it. Uh, come let us join 70 in uh, the book 70 in the Apsley Hymnal. Come let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne, ten thousand thousand other tongues, but all their joys are one. Worthy the Lamb that died, they cry to the exalted bus. It's a good place to end on Christmas Day, isn't it? To think of the Saviour who is.